first event in the Radical Black Women series launched by Lawrence Wishart in partnership with the Black Cultural Archives. My name is Jamana. I'm the books editor at Lawrence Wishart and the creator of this series. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the series before passing over to today's moderator to introduce the panellists. The Radical Black Women series is a new book series that seeks to spotlight the contributions of black women to social justice movements in Britain. And it was born out of a, de a desire to redress, if only in a really small way, the lack of resources on black British history in general that were available and black women's history in particular. The first book in that series is a new edition of Claudia Jones, A Life in Exile by Marika Sherwood with a new preface by Black feminist researcher Lola Olufemi. We're offering attendees of this event 25% off the book with the discount code Claudia Launch Event, and that's valid up until the 10th of October. We'll put the code upon the screen uh, a number of times during the event. Um, make sure you head over to lwbooks.co.uk to get your copy. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's event, Deanna Lane Cook. Hello. Hi, 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 good evening. Nice to see you. Um, Deanna is currently the oral history and project officer at Wesley's Chapel for an exhibition celebrating black and Asian leaders within the Methodist church. She completed a master's at the University of Birmingham focusing on the histories of Caribbean women in Britain and an undergraduate degree in history and English literature at Queen Mary University. Deanna also has a brilliant weekly podcast called The History Hotline, where she discusses Black British history. Deanna, thank you so much for hosting the discussion today. I'm going to leave you to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Jamana, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on the launch of the Radical Black Women series. Um, and Lawrence Wish are hosting these three launch events together with the pub um, publishing partners. Uh, from the Black Cultural Archives and today's panel, Black History Matters, we will be exploring the importance of Black British history, but also acknowledging its complexities in conducting research, as well as writing it, promoting it and sharing it with a wider public audience. And before I announce, you know, all the fantastic panellists today, a bit of housekeeping for you. Um, so, we will be monitoring um, the chat for any questions or comments, so please feel free to send those in as the talks progress and make a contribution at any point. We will reserve a section of time at the end for all your uh, questions um, and for the panellists to answer. Uh, live captioning is available. It's automated, so there might be errors and the conversation is being recorded and a transcript will be made available at a later date. I believe it's been streamed on the Black Cultural Archives YouTube channel. And now to introduce the fantastic panel. I'm truly honoured, really, to introduce you tonight. I'm more than excited to hear what they will have to say on the opening night of the Radical Black Women launch. So firstly, I'm joined by Marika Sherwood. Marika is the author of Claudia Jones, A Life in Exile, which was republished earlier this month, and also a number of other titles on topics such as Pan-Africanism, Pan-African history, and Black history more widely including texts such as After Abolition, Britain and Slave Traders since 1807, and my personal favourite, Many Struggles, West Indian Workers and Service Personnel in Britain, 1939 to 1945. Marika was one of the founding members of the Black and Asian um, Studies Association, and we are very thankful to have her here today. Welcome, Marika Sherwood. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And our second panellist is Claudia Tomlinson. Welcome, Claudia. Claudia um, is a doctoral candidate at the University of Chichester, whose thesis is entitled Journey from Communism in British Guyana to, sorry, in British Guyana to Black Radicalism in the Global no North, a political biography of Jessica Huntley. 1927 to 2013. Um, Claudia also contributes to the Black History Matters publication and conferences. Claudia, welcome to the panel tonight. Thank you, Deanna. Very happy to be here. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you. And our third panelist is Tion Paris from the Young Historians Project. Welcome, Tion. Tion is a PhD student at the University of Hertfordshire and a senior researcher with the Young Historians Project. In both roles, um, she's interested in the interpersonal and intergenerational transfer of knowledge and history 
Her current PhD research covers US history and the connections between black radical women of the early 20th century and the black power movement in the latter half of the 20th century. So welcome Tion. Thank you, thanks. Wonderful. So thank you all for joining me on this panel today. I am sure we are about to engage in some really insightful and inspiring conversations about black British history, radical black women, and you know, why black history matters so much. So for our opening questions, Marika, I'm coming to you first, if you don't mind. So for people watching, you know, we are here for the, the relaunch of, of the your book about Claudia Jones. For those who haven't read the book yet or don't know much about Claudia Jones, please could you briefly tell us about her and, and what the book is about? Well, Claudia Jones um, was born in Trinidad. Um, her parents had emigrated to the USA. She joined them. She lived for a long time in the USA, um, was a member of the Communist Party there. It's important to emphasize that the Communist Party in America was very much concerned with racial discrimination. The Communist Party in the UK was not at all. Um, anyway, Claudia became a very, very senior person within the Communist Party in the USA. So it's hardly surprising that she ended up in jail. <laughs> um, and America wanted to deport her, of course. Um, back to Trinidad because she didn't have US citizenship. At the Trinidad governor was absolutely horrified and said, I can't possibly have Claudia here. <laughs> um, so she was brought over here to the UK and she lived the last years of her life here. Now, of course, she was very surprised that the Communist Party here had no interest in her whatsoever. So she had to begin doing what she had been doing in the USA, but by herself. She needed to struggle against racial discrimination, study for equality, study for the rights of women as well as men, and realize when she'd been here for a while that there was no real unity yet among the many black peoples here that there had been no major organization trying to achieve this. So she set about trying to do that. And of course, one outcome of that was the West Indian Gazette and Afro-Caribbean News a newspaper because she knew it's one of the things she did in the US as well, that newspapers were very, very important. Um, she started um, a beauty queen contest now, black women weren't supposed to be beautiful at all, right? You weren't even women. You weren't even worth looking at. But here was a beauty queen contest. Um, and it was well reported. And she also started what um, ended up being um, the Notting Hill Carnival. Because it was, again, a way of bringing all Caribbean people together. Because after all, there had been carnivals, um, not just in Trinidad people hadn't joined together before she said, no, we're going to have a carnival, we're going to work together and we're going to show the rest of the world here in London and in the UK some of our culture, some of our culture. This was music. Um, so that's what Claudia was. Um, worked all over the UK, meeting people telling them to organize, telling them to get together, saying that it was only when we were working together that we had some chance of achieving equality in this country, which had such an appalling level of racial discrimination. Now, before I say anything else about Claudia, I must say that um, one of the people who worked with her was Amy Ashwood Garvey. Um, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, who was also living in Britain on and off most of her life. And um, somebody's now trying to do some research on Amy. So if anybody had any information, could you please let me know and I will pass it on to the person doing the research. And there is, I think, something very important to say about researching black activists in this country. The government has withheld 
all files on them. And I think this is a way of wiping out that history. There were no black activists because there's nothing to be active about, right? Everything here was fine. So if you go to our national archives and look for the undoubted daily surveillance files on Claudia, they're not there. They're not there on Amy. They're not there on anybody, just about anybody. And I think we should start, or you should start, I can't, I'm, I'm too old and I don't live in London anymore, so I don't have daily contact with people. But I think we need a massive campaign for all the files um, on black activists to be found and released. They existed, had existed here for a long time. But you go to the National Archives and you don't exist. So you, Diane, Claudia, all of you here with a black face don't exist. As a Hungarian, I don't exist either. <laughs> I, I must tell you, I have tried to ask um, for files on me and I was told, why do you think there would be files on you? And I said, well, because the books that I was writing, the research I was doing, were an enormous threat to the government. I was stopped teaching, for example, stopped teaching at any level anywhere. And I was never given any research money. So it's a way of trying to stop the research I was doing. So all this also has to be changed. But please, we need a campaign for the release of the papers on black activists. Thank you. Wonderful. Absolutely. And I think you've made very clear some of that erasure, clear, very clear erasure in the archives. And, you know, as researchers and historians, you can't simply do this research very easily anyway without access to to clear and you know plentiful archives um, and Marika I had a second follow-up question for you which links very nicely um, and I was just thinking back to the 1998 introduction um, of your text and you said something had to be done about Claudia Jones before it was too late and I believe you meant in regards to telling her story um, and I just wanted to ask, was it difficult to conduct the research needed to write that story? Or, you know, because that generation of people that might have known her were getting older and potentially passing away, or were there bigger challenges? I mean, you've mentioned the fact that the archives, you know, didn't have anything on her. So, yeah, what were what were those challenges well, in writing that, that history? challenge was enormous. But, I mean, what began to worry me was that the elders that I had met in the black communities um, were as old as I am now and were beginning to die. So I thought given that there are no archives on Claudia and that even the materials, so I discovered that were left in her flat when she died, in her room when she died, were missing. The only way forward was in fact to ask people who remembered her to talk about her. Now, of course, what I can never tell is what on earth does it feel like if you're a Barbadian or a Jamaican or a Trinidadian and this Hungarian woman comes to talk to you about a black woman. Now, how do you feel about it? Um, I know, or in my experience, when I could say, well, yes, I have been to Jamaica, no, not on holidays, but to search your archives, and I've met many people. And that changed people's attitudes a bit, you know, there was more of a relaxation. But I would guess that um, some of what I was told was because I was a white woman. And I had to be made to understand things that, that were not part of my experience. You know, I have not been racially abused. Well, I, I should add to that, that at one level I was. I come from a Jewish family in Budapest. And um, when the Nazis moved in, um, we had to wear a Star of David on our clothes whenever we were in the street because you couldn't tell a Jewish Hungarian from a Christian Hungarian. We all look the same. And I would guess that because the Nazis were all over the streets, 
Hungarians now felt obliged to name call us or to spit at us. So I have some experience of that, but very, very little. And of course, after the war, it all went. I might have been a refugee. I couldn't speak any English when we emigrated to Australia. But, you know, I didn't go through what you with dark faces go through probably every day. And that does, I'm sure, make a difference when you are talking to me and you wonder how much I understand inside me, not just in my head, but in my heart, you know. And, and I, I, of course, I, I don't know how much I don't understand. Thank you. No worries, absolutely. And I think that speaks to quite an important aspect of research and the role of the researcher in doing this research and if you are coming from outside of a community or writing about how you know how do you approach that and as you said there were probably challenges with that and in terms of understanding but the book I think you know using um, a method such as oral history and actually speaking to people is probably the best way to overcome a struggle such as that and Marika I'm going to give you a little rest um, and we're going to move over to Claudia Tomlinson now Claudia your research is about also another trailblazing woman um, in Black British history. So for anyone that doesn't know um, the name Jessica Huntley, please could you tell us about her and a little bit about the Huntley archives, um, please? Yes, so Jessica Huntley, she was an um, incredible Black woman activist um, who led a, um, a radical life um, of activism throughout her entire adult life. She was born in 1927 um, in Guyana, which was part of the British colony at the time, um, known as British Guyana. And um, she grew up in quite significant poverty in the 30s and 40s. And uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, colonial nations, their economies were tethered to the um, colonial powers and um, they suffered significant economic distress, um, more significantly than the colonial powers. Um, so she grew up as part of a, a strong African descended family, um, female household um, following the, the early death of her father. And um, she, um, within Guyana, she, became a um, political activist in as part of the People's Progressive Organization, which she helped to found. And that became the government in, that was elected to government in 1953. And um, that was also, interestingly, the first time that there was a um, mass enfranchisement of women. So that was the first election that all women could vote in Guyana at the time and um, Jessica played a significant role in that and um, she co-founded the women's section of the People's Progressive Party which was known as the the, the, the Women's Progressive Organization and um, she was an ardent campaigner and she fought very strongly against um, colonial domination um, and fought for the rights of workers also um, within within British Guyana. She migrated in um, 1957. She had already married Eric Huntley, a fellow uh, PPP, People's Progressive Party activist and official. And um, by the time she emigrated, she was already a, a mother of two young children um, who were left behind in the Caribbean. She lived the remainder of her life in Britain um, and she, she died in 2013. And um, during that, that period of time, she became a um, leading Caribbean radical um, fighting to reform um, the, pos the position um, of the very strong anti-blackness culture that existed um, in Britain. And she was um, very much part of um, a, a number of important movements. Um, so the West Indian Standing Conference, 
um, the student movement, student activism movement, although she wasn't a student, she was part of that West Indian, emerging West Indianism in London. Um, but possibly what she's most known for is um, she was a co-founder of Bogle Overture Publishing House in 19... 68 and um, that organization she she co-founded that and um, with leading students and 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 West Indian Af um, activists at the time and she became the figurehead of Bogle Overture and um, it was predominantly a political organization it was born out of a political act the banning of Walter Rodney in um, from Jamaica, from his um, post in, in Jamaica, although um, and but there have been signs that she she had been involved in publishing and um, printing when she was in Guyana. So she, those pr propensities were there. And um, through the remainder of her time in Britain, she was a major figure in the supplementary education movement. The um, Black Parents Movement, the Radical Black and Third World Book Fairs that she was a co-director of. And she was also later on became an, um, an elder stateswoman of um, black radical activism and was involved and sought out for um, to provide advice for campaigns such as the Stephen Lawrence campaign, the New Cross Fire, etc. And um, the the family home, 141 Coldershaw Road in Ealing, now has a, um, a blue plaque. And um, the, the home has been recognized and identified as one of the leading centers of radical black act activism and organizing um, throughout the, well, from, from um, the, the 1970s onwards. Um, so that's uh, Jessica Huntley in a, in a nutshell. And, Fantastic. Uh, did you ask me about the archives? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, please oh, well. do tell us. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah. So the Huntley archives were established around 2005, and that's when they were formally deposited at the London Metropolitan Archives in London. Um, prior to that, um, Jessica Huntley, with her husband Eric Huntley, had been collating their personal business and and uh, um, political records for some time. So they'd always had these documents, and um, but as I said, they were formally accepted in two thousand and five, and they became the, the the kind of the first major Black Caribbean archive that was. Um, deposited in in that way and um, so as I've said the archives comprise the um, personal records so the family records and uh, correspondence photographs and um, they tell a story of family life from around the 1930s 40s in Guyana the story of migration the family migration relocation um, so there's a very strong element of the personal and family records. Then there's also the political and business records, which comprise um, all of the artists and uh, writers that the, uh, that Jessica Huntley and the Huntleys worked with. Um, so for example, they, they were the first publisher of Walter Rodney, Lem Sisse, um, Linton Quasi Johnson, Valerie Bloom in this country, and many other leading authors, and all of those manuscripts and the correspondence relating to the commercial records of those ma manuscripts are, are available. So um, the archives tell the, the, the story of the birth and the journey of um, some of these incredible books, such as Walter Rodney's The Groundings with My Brothers, which was the foundational, at the time regarded as a foundational text of black power in Britain and the Caribbean. And that was followed a couple of years later by How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, also published by Bogle Overture. And um, so those, um, the, the records also tell a, um, a, an incredible story of campaigns organizing and um, groups, um, how groups came together 
um, also tensions within um, within organisations and individuals, but also um, any so anyone who's interested in um, individuals such as John the Rose, etc. Um, that that's a camp. That's the um, those are the archives to go to. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, it's definitely clear, you know, how instrumental these these individuals, well, Jessica Huntley herself and, and Eric as well, um, have been in in documenting, I, I um, say, the works of those people that would have otherwise not been published. And I'm going to give you a little minute and move on to Tion. And Tion, you know, following along from this fantastic trend of um, this panel studying and researching uh, Black women, why did you then choose to you know, study and focus your PhD research on, on radical black women? So I, my answer is a little bit of a roundabout answer. Um, my gateway to radical black women was the Black Panther Party. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate and my master's thesis, I was focusing on the Black Panther Party and, you know, government repression and how this sort of radical group organised, like the way it organised um, against government repression. But one of the things that stood out for me whilst I was doing that research was the women. Um, a lot of Black Panther Party historiography focuses on the men and the kind of masculine, masculinized politics of that group. Um, but I was interested in the women. Um, I think I wanted to know why exactly they had come to the Black Panther Party, what had attracted them to the sort of radical left and the militancy of the party. And that led me, as I was thinking about PhD research, to think these can't have been the first women to think these things or to, to join parties like this. So, um, and then I came across an article called Running with the Reds by LaShawn Harris, which is really a really a, a quick sort of introduction to black women in the Communist Party. And then from there, I sort of ended up down a rabbit hole of um, Claudia Jones, and Islanda Robeson, uh, Louise Thompson Patterson, and all of these American women who, you know, become massive activists in this in this labor movement and these um, left wing movements that are radical. Um, and the the thing I found is that there wasn't a lot written about these women. And um, besides their sort of singular biographies or maybe a, like a, a note in the archives or the stories of other people. Um, I was interested in how these women were interconnected in the networks that they built um, from the organizations that they worked in, like the Communist Party. And I, I just felt like there had to be something missing because these two eras of women had to be connected somehow. Um, and Angela Davis was a massive link to that. Um, obviously, everyone knows Angela Davis. She's a household name. Um, and she obviously was a victim of government repression. And then her mother was involved in um, the Southern Negro Youth Congress as well, which was part of that previous era of radicalism. So my PhD research is about sort of digging into these, these connections between these women and these ideas that they had as well. I mean, Claudia Jones was, you know, coming up with theories that until then had, hadn't been put to paper. Um, and I felt like there had to be some lasting influence in these later periods, like the 60s and 70s. So that's what my research is about and what I'm trying to do. Wonderful. It, yeah, it sounds like a challenge on your part to, but linking those two generations, I think it's so important to, you know, understand the links of these these histories and especially of women when, you know, there is such a, an absence, I'd say, in the, in the books and in the archives. And Claudia, I wanted to go back to you and ask you, um, about you know why you wanted to focus your research on Jessica Huntley, um, you know, was there anything in particular about her, or was it the absence of her? You know, as Tian mentioned, Angela Davis is a household name, and there are other women that are becoming that as well. But Jessica Huntley, unfortunately, not so much. Was there anything that drew you to her? Yes. So um, I think the main, um, well, yes, when I approached the. Um, the selection of a topic, I was very much interested in uh, researching, undertaking research that was linked to my own heritage. And I do share the same heritage as Jessica Huntley, African um, Guyanese. And um, I also wanted to consider the links with, with, with Britain and I wanted to um, understand, to have an opportunity to build that history. So um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the expression history from 
below. So I wanted to undertake um, a historical study um, of subjects or an individual who I felt um, had been neglected. And um, I wanted to undertake that as an act of um, re um, re restoring a part of history that um, had um, been invisibilized um, to a great extent. Um, the other reason was um, Walter Rodney had always been a, um, a hero of mine, uh, someone I was very interested in. And um, so that connection there with Walter Rodney, Bogle Overture and Jessica Huntley was, um, was also a strong connection. Um, one of the other deciding factors was the fact that there was a, a, a very large archive. And um, so it's so the, the Huntley archive um, has proved to be very useful, but so has the George Padmore Institute, which was the archive of John LaRose. And as you show sure everyone knows, John LaRose, Jessica Huntley, Eric Huntley were um, comrades uh, and friends over many decades and um, so so those were those were the sorts sorts of links and obviously her um, character and her individual story um, is unique very and very appealing and um, because I, ha I have a, a, an interest in characters creativity so I wanted that kind of biographical analysis and um, she ticked all the boxes, really. Um, yeah. Wonderful. No, definitely. Such a, a wealth of reasons to, mm -hmm. to choose her for <laughs> your research. Absolutely. And again, you know, bringing these stories of, of a woman like Jessica Huntley to the forefront is exactly what we need to try and change and shift this narrative. Um, and I wanted to talk to you all about um, your methods. I know, Claudia and Tian, you're, you know, just kind of on your journey of your PhDs, but Marika having, you know, completed several books and, and projects. Um, I'll ask you first, um, when we think about kind of oral history projects and, and researching in that way, um, as a researcher, we might expect an answer or feel we know what our um, interviewee is going to say. So when you went out to interview for that um, Claudia Jones text and for your research, did you go into the interviews with preconceived ideas that might be said about Claudia or, or was it kind of you were trying to be led by those oral histories? Well, I don't quite know how to, to reply to that. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you'd have to ask some of the people I have interviewed over the years about what it felt like um, to have this Hungarian woman interview them. Yeah. Um, what I think I would like to say, though, is that I think researching the work of all women is very important. Yeah. Um, if I look at um, the kind of research that's, that's popular in the popular journals, um, the Tudors are always there. And so are all the, the wives and, and then the queens. And as you look at the rest of English history, the only time there's a woman there is if she's a queen. You know, we, we as women don't exist. Now, um, from the research, the little research I did on, um, on Lancashire, um, which became the richest county in England because of the cotton mills, it was the women who worked in the cotton mills. They were the ones who were grossly exploited and whose children were given quietening syrup, so they all died. That was opium, um, which was quite widely used, by the way, around the country at that time. Um, so I think we must put black women um, on the map, on the front line, and get us into the school curriculums and into um, the popular magazines, not just the um, academic magazines, because, you know, I'm not quite sure what influence academic magazines have. I don't very often write for them. <laughs> um, I write for labor history magazines, yes. Um, but 
somehow we have to change the school curriculum, I think. And then eventually, of course, that would change the university curriculum. But the school curriculum has to change. It has to look at the presence of Africans here. I think for about 2000 years, they arrived with the Romans. I don't know if there were any here before that, but they've been here 2000 years. Um, so we have to teach what they have been doing here and how important they were, together with other women, of course. Um, could there have been an industrial revolution? Not just without the money from the slave trade and slavery, but also without the labor of women. Um, would we have an NHS today without women? How many school teachers are women? So all that has, I think, to be to be looked at. And um, something else, I think, though it's not really relevant to Claudia, but I'm sure she would agree with me, is that there is now a possibility for teaching something about the trade in enslaved Africans in the school curriculum. But there is nothing about Africa prior to this. So Africa just didn't exist, you know, and all these people were there and ready to be enslaved. Now, when you look at the history of Africa, you say, well, it, most Africa was way in advance of Europe. Is that why we don't want to teach it? Maybe, maybe. But I think that is also something important. Africa before the arrival of Europeans has to exist in the school curriculum. If you're teaching about Tudor Britain in the 16th century, teach Tudor Africa teach 16th century Africa. I should add to that a wonderful piece of experience I had about this curriculum because I've been campaigning about curriculums since 1991, since we set up the Black and Asian Studies Association. And then Egypt was put on the curriculum. So I went to the library of the um, Institute of Education at London University, which has a massive library to see what books they had on Egypt. They had quite a few. I looked in all of them and in none of them was Egypt part of Africa. The maps were all Egypt and a Caribbean, uh, sorry, a Mediterranean coastline without any other countries being named and then um, Italy and, and Greece. But Africa was never there. I haven't looked at any recent books to see if that's been changed. <laughs> I hope somebody will and make a fuss because, I mean, what does that tell you? Just what does that tell you? That we could now teach the glories of Egypt, but it was not an African country. Thank you for being so patient with me. No, not at all, Marika. Honestly, if you were running for education secretary, I would be voting for you. Um, these curriculum changes are, I think, something especially, um, you know, going through the education system, you know, in, in this country, it's something that is diabolically desperately needed. Um, and you mentioned also um, points about the NHS um, being, you know, populated by women workers. And I just wanted to jump to Tion because the Young Historians Project was about African women in the health service. And um, Tion, I, I believe you've just, you've recently joined, but you worked on that project. And um, you know, how has that kind of helped you in the Young Historians Project, helped you um, to kind of shape your perception of studying and sharing Black history? And you might want to talk about the African and women in healthcare project, if you would like. Yeah, of course. Um, I would say, well, I'll start with my experience of joining YHP. So I went to university in Scotland and I found that in all of my history classes, I was the only person of colour in that class. Um, and to go back to what was said already about the curriculum, the only history I learned about black people was the civil rights movement. There was nothing about black Britain. Um, so that is why I, I guess I pivoted towards American history because that, it just wasn't there for me to learn. Um, so when I started my PhD, I was like, okay, I need to do something about this. I need to find an organization of black historians. Um, I want to socialize with people that like things that I like, but also um, when I joined YHP, I learned, you know, just how, bad the situation was it's it's not a it's not an isolated thing that there there are very few black students going into history 
Um, there was the broken pipeline report of uh, September 2019, which found that between 2017 and 2018, only 3% of PhD students in the UK in their first year were black. So there's a real problem. And that is exactly what YHP is trying to sort of remedy. Um, like you said, our most recent project was on African women in the NHS. We just launched that um, a few months ago. And YHP has really been about kind of telling these stories that have been left out. As you've said, African women, black women have been part of the NHS for a very long time. Um, and they're kind of disregarded. Their impact has been disregarded. So as part of YHP, um, I, I really learned just how how important they were. Not that I didn't already know, but just to hear their stories as well. Um, the way that YHP works is we kind of prioritize oral histories. We want to hear the stories and have these sort of interpersonal exchanges with these people um, if they're around. And um, that is really one of the strengths of YHP is that we are able to contact these people and just sit down with them and talk to them about what it's been like for them um, to be in Britain and to, I guess, uh, endure the, the kind of treatment that they've had, um, good or bad. And overall, YHP is really dedicated to encouraging Black people to go into history because we have to, we need more Black people there to talk about these 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 histories, but if they're not there, it's not going to be told for a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, uh, YHP has been like, <laughs> it's been such a big change for me um, to finally be part of an organization like that and to be able to use my skills with them, but also it's, it's I've gotten a lot from it just to be able to interact with these women. Um, at our most recent launch, we had a few of the women that we interviewed for the African Women in the NHS project. and. It was just, it was amazing to be able to speak to them and hear their stories. Um, a lot of them have migrated um, prior to, you know, 2000 and, and as early as like the 1950s and 60s. So to hear their stories of what Britain was like back then, how, how they've kind of progressed um, and what it's been like for them was invaluable because it's not the stuff that you hear in the classrooms. It's, it's not what you hear most of the time on TV and documentaries, things like that. So um, I think that's, one of the things I just have to stress about YHP that's it really linked to what you guys have said already. Absolutely, definitely. Um, and it's obviously important that, you know, that work is is being done. Um, and I just wanted you to, if you don't mind, adding a final point about how important oral histories have been. You kind of touched on it um, in terms of researching um, black histories, but maybe in comparison to archival research, you know, how has, has that been? Which has been, do you prefer one method over another or is one, you know, more beneficial to the type of work you do? Yeah, I'll say from my experience, um, I've heavily relied on, you know, the traditional archive, you know, go into the archive, take out papers, read through the papers. Um, but with the Young Historians Project, uh, the way they prioritised oral histories has meant that we can a, record the histories and communicate them to other people in a way where the subject is telling their own story for themselves. Um, we, we're not really altering it at all. It's not our narrative. It's just their story and people can perceive it however they want. Um, and I think that's the beauty of oral history because, again, because these women for a long time have not been paid attention to in mainstream history, um, there there is a kind of lacking of their voices. They they don't have the opportunity to tell their stories. So with oral histories and the Young Historians Project, it's it's become a really good way to communicate that. And also for kids who maybe think history is just about reading books, um, it really encourages them because then they think, wait, I could go speak to my grandmother or I could go speak to my granddad. And that's history. It's, it's still history. It's just not on a page. Um, and I think it really encourages people to think about history in a different way. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, encouraging the next generation is always important. Um, and as our kind of final set of questions, I just wanted to think about the legacy um, of, of Black British women and women from Africa and, and the West Indies and the Caribbean and um, what that legacy will look like if we hopefully continue to do research. And um, Marika, I wanted to ask you, um, Claudia Jones is as massively an inspirational woman in British history altogether, let alone um, Black British history is a little subdivision. Um, but alongside your text, how do you think it's best that we honour her legacy and, and, and keep her memory alive? Well, I think we need some material produced for school use to fit in with 
whatever the current um, ideas about uh, um, what should be taught is, um, I think we also need a film about her. Um, maybe a creative film, you know, telling her life story, or maybe people still remembering why they remember her. I don't suppose there is anybody alive, is there, who, who actually knew her? There might be some very people who were very, very young then. But something like that would be important. Um, I think we... Do we need a statue of, of Claudia? Um, yes, maybe. I don't know what, what could be done all over England other than certainly a book not just about Claudia but Claudia within and with all the other active black women and also that would have to be fitted into the background of racial discrimination in this country which again is not taught and is completely overlooked um, and of course, it it was it was there. So maybe um, some people should be interviewed and filmed about their experience of that over the many years they have lived here, or maybe from when they arrived here and and what it was like when they when they arrived. So that you know, the um, the Windrush generation um, is still with us. So they could talk about what it, it was like. Because most people don't want to know. Um, and they must know, because they are part of it. Um, I think another way of bringing some of this home would be to follow up on the compensation records, um, which have been released for people who were given that mere 20 million pounds for the loss of their free labor. But there's been almost no research on what people did with that 20 million when they got it. How much of the industrial revolution was funded by it, the roads, the railways, the canals, the factories, how many of the mansions were built by them. So I think that would also bring home some part of the history that is ignored and that is really the background for Claudia and all the other women and their struggles and it has to be our, our struggles today. Um, I should tell you by the way about all the, um, given that we're talking about hidden records, um, I tried to discover why on earth the Rothschilds um, gave or loaned this money to the government. There's nothing in our national archives. So I went to the Rothschild archives. There's a huge Rothschild archives in London. And I went there and the archivist there was very interested, but we couldn't find anything, absolutely nothing. Now that sort of money was very big money, right? So there would have been massive archives to begin with. And very importantly, a few months after I'd been there, the archivist retired and he got in touch with me and said, Marika, I was so intrigued by not finding anything. As I still have access to the archives, I've now spent days there going through it all, trying to discover what was going on. And he said, it is not there. So what, what does that tell you, you know, just how much, just how much gets hidden? Um, we just don't know because it's all hidden. It's only when some of us um, begin to look for something that you discover that it's, that it's not there. Um, so I, I think that we need to push for more research to be done. Yeah. Um, and for um, the government to open the archives. Mm -hmm. I should tell you, because 
this will tell you about the content of some of the archives that are withheld. After a lot of campaigning, some of the archives on Jomo Kenyatta and um, Kwame Nkrumah were released. Um, not much, but they are released. Um, the papers on Nkrumah only cover a few years and stop in 1952 and some of the pages are withdrawn and some paragraphs are blanked out. But what was important and is important is that George Padmore's telephone was tapped. So there are records of the telephone conversations between George Padmore and Nkrumah. And of course, they would have heard all the other telephone conversations, which gives you a notion of the level of surveillance that activists were under. They were such a threat to Britain and the colonies and the wealth of this country. Um, so we must push for their release because we will learn so much. There is not a single solitary file released on George Padmore, by the way. Wow. One of our major activists, I think. Yeah, um, definitely. As he was, even when he went um, went to work with Kwame and Kuma in independent Ghana. Yeah. No files on him at all. And I think that says, as you've said, it says a lot about, um, you know, the government's agenda and, and what they have or, and don't want us to know or be able to research on. And Claudia, I wanted to come to you because you are, your research is centred around the Huntley archives. Um, I would make the point that archives are sometimes quite inaccessible to members of the general public. Um, you know, if you, it's not necessarily something that you're taught to go and, and do or look for. Um, do you think archives should be more open and accessible and are there any ways you think this could be done or do you think it's the role of, you know, the historian, the researcher to disseminate this information for the wider public? Okay, so I think I would say that um, archival research only forms about 50% of my study and um, the other 50% of my data comes from oral history interviews where I've, um, I'm undertaking significant um, numbers of interviews with Jessica Huntley's um, family, friends, associates, um, extending back to the 1940s where they're still available um, right through to um, as to, um, to, to the 2010 so the the later period of her activism and um, and that's that's been very fruitful but in terms of um, the archives yes I think I would I think it is fair to say that I found the archives very um, quite daunting and I think some are friendlier than others the larger the archives are the um, the, the, the less accessible um, they are and um, I think archives have two kind of main kind of competing objectives. So preservation of records, I think that's their, 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 one of their main priorities and um, ensuring access of the, the records for education and research to, to the public. That's their other objective. And, um, some, and obviously sometimes they clash with each other and I think coronavirus um, um, kind of helped to kind of to, to kind of bring that bring that out um, to, to some extent. Um, so these spaces are very patrolled, they're very policed. And my experience was that during the pandemic they became even more so. And um, so um, the Huntley archives, I would say, would was um, were designed with um, accessibility in mind. And um, there are a number of um, steps that uh, Jessica and Eric Huntley took to ensure accessibility. So there's an annual Huntley conference and um, there are school projects where the um, archival material are kind of taken out and liberated from the archive and uh, made available to ordinary people because the archives can be daunting. There are on online um, events where um, particularly sound archives um, are um, are featured. So I think there is yeah there, there is scope for taking the archives um, archival material outside of the archives and we should continue to do that as much as possible. 
Absolutely. And I do, yes, the Huntley Archives, I think, are doing a fantastic job. I've been to, I think, the last one before the pandemic um, for the day. And, you know, you go around and they teach you how to look through. And, and it is it is a wonderful day, definitely. Um, and kind of coming to the final questions and to the audience, thank you so much for listening um, so far so patiently. And I'm, I'm seeing some questions coming in, but please feel free to ask away any questions for any of our panellists um, that you might be thinking. Um, they are coming in slowly, but I'll keep... Um, at my questions until um, they do fill up. So um, Tian, I did wonder, um, you've worked with the Young Historians Project and I'm sure, you know, on your own, maybe social media platforms, um, you've probably been able to use a range of mediums to kind of disseminate this information, podcasts, documentaries, articles, you know, papers, you name it. Um, how would you like to see black women uh, documented going forwards? Um, are any of these your preference or are there, you know, new and innovative ways we could be we could be looking at? Yeah, I I I think YHP um, does a really good job of kind of firing on all cylinders. Um, we've got such a range of different ways that you can consume the history, um, which, as someone who's come from academia and is in academia, it can be really limited. It's really just you know you got to write something, and maybe you'll talk about the thing. Um, but for the most part, I I have found for my own personal sort of um, the things that I liked about research so far is oral histories. Um, for my own research, it's kind of difficult to do that because a lot of the women that I look at um, have either passed away or they're very, very elderly and they're in the US. So it can be really difficult to sort of navigate these stories. Um, but I think for, for the sake of the Young Historians Project, uh, I think we will continue to sort of um, use a range of media and materials um, to sort of make these histories accessible as well, which is um, something that I, I often think about in my own research is, is, is this accessible? Will someone who doesn't know anything about this subject be interested in the way that I've communicated this? And I think the Young, Histor sorry, the Young Historians Project is uh, really important um, in, in the way that they, they have chosen a lot of different ways. Um, to do that and again for as, as Marika has said already movies we need them <laughs> we need we need other ways to consume our histories and to obviously communicate our histories as well to other people um, and I think as well for you Diana your your podcast as well is is amazing it's so accessible and obviously kids kids can find that easily it's not really daunting to start and I think that's a really important thing going forward as historians is to consider is this going to reach the masses? Like we we need to think of ways to communicate our own histories um, in ways that are accessible to everyone. Absolutely, um, I think that's definitely the case. And and as we've mentioned, of so many ways of these these histories being, you know, more accessible. Um, and Claudia, I just wondered, you know, you're working within um, academia and a higher education institution, as you are, Tian, as well, um, and you know, there is an issue at the moment with, uh, you know, black PhD students being funded for their research and, and being able to to start on these, um, you know, programs in order to, to create this knowledge. Um, what have been maybe your, your biggest challenges with research so far, if you've had any, um, or if you'd like to speak on that, you know, funding and matters of that? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm self-funding, so um, that isn't something that's really um, affected me, but I am aware that um, there have been um, increasing numbers of um, PhD students working in this area um, who have secured funding. So um, I don't know the, um, the overall statistical position, but it does appear to be improving. And um, in terms of working in academia, Generally, I do think that um, it's a huge challenge, and um, there are, and that challenge is becoming even greater. Um, and my biggest challenge um, has been about um, the, the 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 subject, the to the topic of Black history. As we know, it has really come under a lot of threat um, recently, and. Um, it's there's there's huge challenge to actually just do that work. I I don't know if anyone heard Boris Johnson's um, conference speech yesterday. I've got a little clip. If I've got a, a, a minute to uh, just read that out, what he said about history, and he said that um, and we attack and deny our history at our peril, and when they began to attack 
Churchill as a racist, I was minded to ignore them. That's, that's, that's Boris Johnson. And um, it's only 10 years ago, BBC audiences overwhelmingly voted him the greatest Britain of all time because he helped defeat a regime um, that was defined by one of the most vicious racisms the world has ever seen. They really do want to rewrite our national story, starting with Hereward the Woke. And uh, the final sentence, um, he said that, um, Boris Johnson said that we really are at the risk of a kind of no nothing cancel culture, um, no nothing iconoclasm, and we conservatives will defend our history and cultural in, um, inheritance, not because we are proud of everything, but because we are trying, um, they are trying to edit. Um, and I know it is now dishonest um, as a, as a, that's a dishonest as a celebrity trying to edit Wikipedia anyway. So that was um, sufficiently a um, subject of interest or a stance of our current um, government that it does actually make it very, very, very um, difficult to just talk about being a student of black history. Um, so that, that I would say is my biggest challenge. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that, because, you know, the current climate in which we all work in passed down from the government and, and the political, you know, sentiments that are going around are obviously going to have an impact on on society as a whole, let alone researchers. And Marika, um, I am told you might be departing. But before you go, I wanted wondered if I could ask one question from the comments that's directly for you. Um, and that is, um, does Claudia Jones have any family members still alive? Um, that Marika could consult with. Um, I don't know if you would know that, or you know, maybe assume if if there would would be anybody around still. Marika, I think you're you're muted. Um, she oh. has no children, um, and I don't remember if she had any brothers or sisters. I think not. No, I think she was an only child. Yeah, so there are no relatives. And as far as I know, there's nobody now doing any more research on her either. But that could be my, my ignorance. You know, I, I don't live in London anymore, which means that you're not in daily <laughs> touch with everybody. Absolutely. I want to thank you all for being so very patient with me. It was our pleasure. <laughs> I must tell you that I used to sit by... Claudia's grave. I lived downhill, not in the Highgate area. <laughs> I had no money. <laughs> but it was within walking distance of her grave and I used to go up there and, and sit by her to sort of take in her strength. And I knew that I had to commit myself to working. If she could work when she was ill all her life, and I was a very healthy woman, not wealthy, but healthy, then I had to tell her, and I did, that I would continue working until the day I dropped dead. And that's what I am trying to do. Thank you all for listening to me. Thank you so much, Marika. To go on. No, thank you for joining us and your words of wisdom. We've got to, you know, interrogate these files in the archives to try and start a campaign. We're, we're campaigning about the curriculum. You've planted so many seeds for us to think about um, moving forward. So thank you so much, Marika. Thank you for being here thank tonight. You. We'll move forward. And thank, thank you, you. we much. will, definitely. Thank you. Um, and now back to some of the other questions. What have we got here today? So um, we've got a question um, about, oh, we've got a nice question about films and documentaries um, from Lou. Um, and that is about, do you have any films that you'd suggest on these subjects? Um, I've seen a few that are more entertainment focused rather than history, but I'd like to find more documentaries. Um, entertainment focused film and suggestions are welcome, but I think we're looking for something more um, historically accurate, maybe Lou. Um, so yeah, Tion or Claudia, whoever wants to go first. Um. Um, I, I would say for my work, that is kind of the problem is that there aren't really movies about these women um, that I'm looking at, women like Claudia Jones, um, Miss Landa Robeson, Louise Thompson-Patterson. Um, but I would recommend, um, there are a lot of 
sort of seminars just like this where you can see historians talk about the books that they've written um you can search on youtube um i don't know there's a whole world out there of uh organizations and events like this who have you know had these conversations it's just not obviously on the front page of the internet so i recommend um yeah use the internet yes i would just um recommend the um the recent steve mcqueen bbc series and um what my critique there would be that um many of those stories are perhaps not told from the perspective of many of the leading women and they don't necessarily showcase um, some of the, the, the leading women who were involved in those histories. Those histories still are largely told um, as the histories of the male activists who were around at the time. Um, however, the, the episode on education, looking at uh, supplementary education, um, then that does um, um, spotlight women, mothers, um, and that's that's something that's worth looking at. What, yeah, absolutely, definitely. And just to throw in a few of my own, um, there's a Netflix documentary. I'm not sure if Netflix created it called Journey um, from an or Journey to an African Colony, um, and it speaks about the history of Nigeria um, and pre-colonization and post and kind of that process. Uh, and there is a wonderful episode on on women and, and their kind of activism during that time, which we rarely ever hear about. Um, I would say um, there have been a few documentaries. And one thing I have noticed in the UK is when these documentaries are done, I don't think they're publicised very well. So sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper um, than the ordinary Tudor documentary that seems to grace our screens a lot more often. Um, but an important point from Ria um, in the comments is I think films and docuseries are an interesting topic because... A lot of them are awesome. I think the industry owes it to us to not only create trauma-based films, but ones that empower us too. And so I think that is a really important sentiment to think about. And when we are thinking about these histories that can be surrounded by a lot of racial injustice and trauma, you know, how are they going to be made in the future to empower us? A really good point. Um, thank you. And I think um, the documentaries mentioned are being, are being added in. Um, Sorry, can I also add? For yeah, white, go ahead. We had African Women the NHS. We've done of documentaries course. on the Black Liberation Front as well. Um, so check out the Young Historians Project website because we have things archived, documentary series, and like interviews as well. Um, and we're also obviously the History Matters Conference is on right now. Um, so please do go look at the website, look at History Matters as well, um, because that is kind of a gateway into learning more about these topics. Wonderful, definitely. Um, and moving on to another question from Kirsty Thompson. Um, what would you suggest as a starting point for someone with an interest in archival work? I'm an English Lit and History student and I'm very keen to get into this line of work. Um, I can give a small amount of advice. I did want to be in the archives at one point in my life and I do believe, and I'm not sure if they still do it because of COVID and, you know, opening back the Black Cultural Archives, you can volunteer there and a lot of archives would happily take volunteer as I know it's not ideal to not be paid for your labour. Um, but you know, the, you'll have the knowledge and experience, I'm sure, from your studies and your academic work. So trying to get your foot in the door in those kinds of ways could also help you. Um, I'm not sure if you need further study for archival work, so I wouldn't want to say so if that's not the case. But um, I'll ask Claudia and Tian if you've got any more information or knowledge about that. I would just um, say that uh, have a look at the, cat the online catalogues. Um, all of the archives, they um, they do provide um, very good guides, particularly the, the Huntley archives of BCA. In fact, they, they all do. They provide very good um, um, overviews, introduction. And um, it, you know, if you're interested in a particular topic, then that might be well, or that might be a way of identifying a particular topic and um, and then following that up with with a visit. But I do think uh, the website and 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 just un, just uh, I, understanding what's available is a good starting point. Definitely. And Tian, did you have anything to add? Um, I don't think so. I think you guys have covered it. I think another thing though, it's just just ask call up call up libraries, call up archives, ask the people directly. They're, they're there to help you. Um, if you're not sure what you're looking for, these people are all trained. Uh, they're, they, they've done the work and they, they can lead you to exactly what you're looking for. 
Absolutely, very well said. <laughs> um, and our, another question from the comments from Maureen Rutter. Uh, what history networks would you recommend to gain support from and give support to as a black female historian trying to develop the excellence and enjoy the process? And I'm glad you said enjoy the process because it is so important that you enjoy this research. It can be traumatic, it can be so difficult at times to do. But enjoyment, you know, it should be a priority. So I'll open that one up to the two of you. Um, any net history networks that you would recommend for support? I mean, I mean oh, sorry, sorry, no, you go. <laughs> I was just, I was only going to just mention um, BASA, which um, was uh, mentioned by Marika, and um, I, I mean, that's mainly an, an online network. Um, the Black and Asian Studies Association, but that is um, that's something that you can join, and um, um, it's a great way of, of obtaining information, um, a wealth of information about what's happening, um, contemporary information, trends, events, activities, and um, that's that's free. That's free to join. So I would recommend that that's one possibility. Yeah, I would add as well. Um, this is a very topical question because that's exactly the same question I had when I started this year. Um, I didn't know any Black women historians besides myself. So um, what I did was I made a Twitter account and I searched all of the things that seemed relevant to what I studied. And I found women who maybe weren't even studying the same thing I was. Um, and I messaged them and I said, hey, do you want to chat? And even this, just this past week, I um, spoke to a, a historian and we chatted and she had so many connections that she was able to share with me because she'd been in, in academia much longer and is actually a lecturer. So um, I think definitely just don't be afraid to reach out. Um, don't, don't be afraid. I think the only way that you can really network and connect with other women historians, black women historians specifically, is just to reach out to them. Um, we're all in the same boat. Uh, and also a lot of the women that we will study were in the same boat. They needed to make these networks to be able to do their work and to be able to, to thrive. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to people. Don't be afraid about it. Um, and I think most people, I know I am happy to speak to anyone most of the time because it's just good to have people that are also interested or in the same position. So yeah, that's what I'd say. Absolutely, I definitely agree. Twitter's a really good place, I think, for as black academics. There's um, also, um, an organisation called Black in Academia, which looks broadly um, at black people in academia across all the subjects. But they do, um, I think, annual or biannual talks and um, big events. They used to be in person. I think the last one was on online. Um, but they are really good to go to. They're very inspiring. They always have a really nice keynote speaker as well. And it kind of gets you going for another, like, several few months of research. Um, so I would definitely um, say them. And also on Twitter, Black in Arts and Humanities, that's a group of, of Black researchers in the arts and humanities especially, um, that was started by some PhD researchers as well. So yeah, there's there's a wealth. I think sometimes it just takes a bit of digging, um, especially on Twitter. I think that's the kind of home, home the home hub of it all. Um, and I think Pauline, has you've put your Twitter in there anyway, so people can reach out to Pauline if, if necessary and if this fits and okay another question what have we got da, da, da. oh pauline said you're also passionate it's great um do you have any favorite historians or other person that has inspired you into your journeys into history uh tian do you want to go first oh that's a tough question <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean there are so many i i'm trying to think you know what what popped into my head first but um, I think honestly it was women like Angela Davis who's kind of you know more of a cultural icon than a historian I would say but she's obviously written about history um, yeah I just I but that was my gateway into sort of black radical women specifically um, but now in my research I am finding that a lot of the women that I'm looking at have written so much and are just so intelligent and it's really inspiring to to read about their stories and I guess that kind of motivates me as well to to keep unearthing their stories because nobody else is talking about them like not enough people are talking about them um women like Islanda Robeson I often think about her since I read um a biography on her and she herself was a writer and um an activist and she traveled all over Africa um and maintained a diary in which she sort of used this diary to talk 
against the sort of ideas of what it meant to be African and these sort of colonial ideas of what Africans were. Um, and she wrote in her diary, An African Journey, all about this. Um, and it's just, it, and this was the 1940s. So when you think about the fact that was being written back then and people aren't talking about it, um, you know, people are talking about, um, you know, uh, anti-colonial sort of anti-racist, um, anti whatever ideas that we have today, it's it's kind of the same ideas being rehashed. <laughs> um, the 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 literature is out there. These women have written about it. It's just been lost. So I think that that really inspires me when I come across things like that, and I'm like, oh, this has been talked about already. <laughs> Great. Yes, I think I think there are so many um, sources of in inspiration um, for me. Walter Rodney. Um, he's a, a, a scholar activist. I've talked about him, and um, I think I'm. A bit, I've been very inspired by activists, grassroots activists, to find out more about their journey, why their stories are not told, or why they are, are, are told in in certain ways. And um, someone like David Olasoga, um, I think he's been given a high profile, but he has also suffered a great deal of retaliation and backlash in recent years um, because of the, uh, the, the the threats against black history by the dominant society and, and political narratives. But he's someone um, who has brought history to our TV screens. Um, and um, so I, I always found him very inspirational. Um, another, obviously, Hakim Adi, who's my professor and uh, my supervisor, and he's been at the forefront of Black history um, for, um, for for several decades. And uh, and he is he is very inspirational and, and particularly passionate um, about ensuring that women's women's stories are told. Very very supportive of. Um, Black women's stories and um, Olivette Otelli. I would also largely, lastly, just um, give her a, a shout out. And she, she specialises in slavery, and not uh, not everyone is interested in that. But it's such an um, important topic that nobody knows enough about. And so it's great that uh, that she was appointed at uh, at, at Bristol uh, a couple of years ago. Um, yep. Yeah, so that, those are my inspirations. Thank you. Fantastic. And yeah, on the note of Olivet Atelle, um, when I started my undergraduate degree, there were no black professors, uh, women of history. And then in 2016, she was given a Professor Saw Real Chair. So a wonderful inspiration. And I wanted to add as well, um, my master's supervisor, Dr. Sadia Qureshi at the University of Birmingham. Um, I think it's important to have supervisors that not only obviously do what you do and can inspire you in terms of research, but are very supportive and help you with the kind of challenges you face researching, you know, burnout, how to, to write in a certain way and all those other skills that you need. So um, definitely would love to mention her. And there are so many, I think, kind of black women in there aren't so many, sorry, black women um, in history as, you know, lecturers, professors and, and so on. But the ones that are there are really, really doing the work and unfortunately have that extra burden of being black and the only black in an institution. Um, and also having the pressure of kind of looking out for sometimes all the other minority students as well. So, you know, definitely giving giving praise to them at, at this time. Um, have we got any more questions? Um, thank you all as well for sharing all these links um, in the comments. Those of you that are answering each other's questions in there. Thank you so much. It's been really helpful. Um, we've got another question from uh, Kirsty Thompson. So it's difficult and complicated as we are in the UK. But is there anything we can do to speak out against what is going on in America with attitudes against critical race theory? And um, I don't know a heap about this, but I think there is kind of like a war against critical race theory. It's being painted as this big, bad thing that, you know, is coming to, to grab your children in the night. So um, I don't know if any of you want to speak about that and, and how we can kind of support. There is, a, I think, comments have been made in Parliament about critical race theory here as well. So it's a war that might start here too, but I think America are battling a bit harder. Tian. Yeah, um, I, I've actually written about this um, because it, it partially um, sort of blends into my research um, as a historian. Um, yeah, you could search my name and read my article about it. But generally, critical race theory is a kind of boogeyman that's been created and often pops up with just a different name every couple of decades, which is really just the fear of change in society. It's a change 
um, or fear of change uh, and this idea that by allowing other stories or other um, diverse histories to, to join the mainstream, it means something else is being taken out of, you know, white history or mainstream history, which is not the case. Obviously, it's not the case. But um, I would say it's it's kind of, it's likely to end up becoming a thing in the UK because I think with a lot of sort of racial issues um, that the US has that it kind of bleeds back into the UK it just takes a bit longer to get here um, so it's definitely something to um, be educated on and to be aware of and to be able to talk out against it because it's it really is just a, a kind of straw man and it's a way to push back against initiatives and organizations and historians like us who are really trying to unearth stories that need to be told um, so I would say, yeah, it, it is important, um, definitely, you know, read up about it, but, um, I guess try and, try and just think of it as it's just backlash. It's, it's not, it's not real. Um, it's just propaganda. Yes, I would agree. I think, um, there is, um, some evidence of, um, the a retaliation against um, critical race theory, and uh, the uh, the Conservative Party in particular have um, placed it at the centre of their um, their culture wars or their their, their war on on um, any attempts to um, look at other subjects or broaden um, his subjects um, that are being looked at in terms of historical research. And um, Kemi Badenoch. Um, in particular, um, when she was, I think she was Equalities Minister, I think she's been promoted now, did some work for the Conservative Party um, around critical race theory. And um, they focused on attempts essentially at outlawing it and, um, and outlawing the teaching of critical race theory and using... Um, any concepts such as white fragility and seeking to strengthen narratives that overturn those um, those concepts. And um, yeah, so I think potentially it's set to grow um, in the UK as well. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I think as well, just to be that person that plugs their own work, but um, I did a reaction to Kemi Badenoch's speech in Parliament about critical race theory um, on the podcast. I broke down every single part of that speech because it was packed in with so many mis misconceptions, inaccuracies. Um, and, you know, I think for the most part, anyone that's been to school in this country, I don't think anybody's ever sat down and had a lesson on critical race theory or been told if you are a black person, be a victim, or if you are a white person, you have privilege. So, you know, I don't, really think it is as you've said it is a boogeyman that kind of comes out when we want to the people that you know are in these positions of power want to you know kind of go back and go against what research is being done um so definitely um something to think about and always be aware that this research does come with a backlash um and there are a lot of people that don't want to necessarily see these things being done um and you kind of have to to go with that now We've got a final question and it's a beautiful question. I'm, I love it. What would you like to be doing in five years if anything is on offer anywhere in the world and well paid? <laughs> I, I think um, Pauline means within history or within this research, because otherwise I, I would just be, you know, lying on a beach somewhere. But let's kind of answer it within history <laughs> just for the sake of this talk. <laughs> Um, yeah, whoever wants to. Yeah, for me, I mean, I have, um, I'm probably halfway through my um, doctoral program. So in about 18 months or so, I'll, I'll should have finished um, 18, 20 months, all being well. So I have already started to think about what I would like to do. And um, I, I would definitely like to focus more on research. There are so many individuals, women, men, um, who, who, we need to shine a, a spotlight on and as Marika was saying there are so many different ways of of doing that and um, creative writing is a particular interest of mine so I would love to see um, drama tv drama series period drama about some of our um, fantastic heroes so um, instead of endless programs such as Mr Selfridge told from certain perspectives why can't we have the um, dramatized stories of some of our amazing heroes. And I'd like to be part of that. 
Wonderful. And here's to that happening. <laughs> Tian, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'm I'm quite early in my PhD. I'm in my first sort of six, seven months. So I'd I think if I'm truly honest. I didn't go into history for money. I never really expected that this will end up being a career that is super lucrative because even before I joined the field um, in my PhD, I was sort of told to think very carefully about whether I wanted to go into academia because it's very difficult and there are jobs very scarcely and you have to really, really, really want this. Um, so I think five years down the line, if I am comfortable, if I'm happy, um, I want to keep telling the kinds of stories that I that I'm trying to tell. Um, I think it's it's a passion that I have, and I, I I just hope that nothing sort of changes in that that regard. I want to keep being you know part of YHP. I want to keep working with other Black historians to you know give them a platform and to sort of inter have interconnections with them as well and kind of grow the field of Black history in the UK wonderful and again I hope that all happens for you definitely um and I don't know if I don't really know what I want to be doing in five years um while probably hopefully still podcasting um I like the idea of bringing histories to you know a regular audience and also hopefully I will have started a PhD and finished in five years maybe but we'll see um and yeah I think as Tian said academia is it seems like a scary place um for the most part in terms of, of jobs and being a black woman in those spaces. Um, but, you know, as you said, if anything is on offer, I'll take a hot country. Um, and if it's well paid, then yeah, I'll take all the money too. But um, it's definitely not a job you do for the money. But um, some of the points Marika made as well about the films being made about these women and um, into the curriculum as well, I would love to see curriculum change. Um, I've worked with a lot of, of children through the podcast and, and past jobs I've had. and. I think if they are, you know, educated and exposed to these histories young enough, they will make that change themselves in the future because it will be so instrumental to their lives and development. So that is something I'd, I'd like to see, not necessarily to do on my own. Um, I think it will take a village, but definitely we'd like to see those changes for the future. And unless Tian or Claudia have any more points, I think we are at that part of the night where it's time to wrap up and say goodbye to this wonderful space and this wonderful talk. Um, I would like to say thank you to our panellists, Marika, who isn't here, but thank you, Marika, Tian um, and Claudia, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and also to Lawrence Wishart and to the Black Cultural Archives, um, their partners. Um, and remember the discount code, Claudia Launch Event, for 25% off that book. Okay. Get the book. Keep Here we go. Mm -hmm. yeah, there we are. Um, and you can get that at lawrencebushartsbooks.co.uk. Um, and unless there is anything else to add, I hope you all have a wonderful evening um, and stay very safe and, and keep going, keep fighting in solidarity to you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.